This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel, get access to our patrons-only Discord, and early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. Girl Boss Feminism is Dead In 2023, the only mention of the word girl boss you're still likely to find is in an ironic gaslight gatekeep girl boss TikTok from 2020 finally making it to YouTube Shorts or in articles about how nobody uses the word girl boss anymore. There aren't any girl bosses left. Not really. At least, none who embrace that word anymore. And it's not hard to see why. If you had to trace a crude history of the word, it all starts in 2014 with Sofia Amoruso coining girl boss with her book of the same name. Girl Boss immediately takes off. It becomes a Netflix show within just a few years, and an endless collection of mugs and t-shirts labeled My Favorite Position, CEO. But it didn't take long for this initial enthusiasm to be completely overshadowed. For nearly a decade following Amoruso's book, women were forced to step down from leadership positions in a ton of companies, like Away, Refinery29, and Glossier, including Amoruso herself stepping down from her role as CEO of Nasty Gal, once it was revealed that these workplaces were toxic breeding grounds for racism and sexism. It's fair to say that this completely changed the general public's idea of girl bosses, and the word became a pejorative few people still wanted to be associated with. If I had to guess, the whole era probably culminated with Elizabeth Holmes's trial, which really put the final nail in the coffin for the word girl boss. So why make a video about girl boss feminism in 2023? If hardly anyone is claiming that word anymore, why am I still talking about it? Two reasons. One, a lot of the backlash against girl boss feminism was really backlash against individual women. What I mean is that the end of the girl boss era was heavily driven by the idea that what was wrong with it was the existence of bad people, specifically hypocritical women. Women who would make feminist statements but create sexist environments in the workplaces they ran. This not only misses the point, I think, but also usually gave way to anti-feminist rhetoric and at times even downright misogyny, including here on the left. Two, just because girl boss is no longer in the zeitgeist doesn't mean the political discourse it conveys, what's called neoliberal feminism, has gone away. In this video, what I'm hoping to do is clear up what's actually wrong with girl boss, or neoliberal, feminism. Neoliberal feminism completely ignores the importance of structural power. It diminishes the importance of class and race, tries to depict feminism as this standalone and individualistic political idea, and incorrectly equates individual successes with collective emancipation. As a result, neoliberal feminism actually reinforces gender depression, and promotes a vision of feminism that's really only available to the 1%. In other words, the root of the problem lies not with individual girl bosses, but with neoliberal girl boss feminism itself. And just because the word girl boss is mostly gone doesn't mean that this political discourse is. Before I start outlining this whole thing, by the way, I should specify that I'm not an expert in women's studies or feminist theory, so I'm going to rely pretty heavily on the work of feminist authors that I've cited in the description. If anything I talk about sounds interesting to you, I definitely didn't come up with it myself, and you can probably find a book or an article in there that explains it in depth. Anyway, neoliberal feminism. What is it? In short, neoliberal feminism takes all the collective action that feminist politics has traditionally been built on and just scraps it. Neoliberal feminism, like neoliberalism more generally, is highly and myopically individualistic. It centers the idea that politics is mainly something happening at the individual level, something that people nurture within themselves and apply to their own lives, not something that people engage in collectively. As such, it doesn't necessarily completely ignore structures of power, but for neoliberals and neoliberal feminists alike, these only exist insofar as they can be overcome. They're not really things that can be abolished or changed. They're more like hurdles in the individual's journey to success. Neoliberal politics, as you might expect, is heavily dependent on the idea that things like self-reliance, efficiency, and most importantly, entrepreneurship and hard work are moral qualities. And by contrast, it paints things like welfare or universal public services as handouts. Things that one should be ashamed of and interpret as a sign of personal failure. A sign of not being good enough to live without them. For example, neoliberal politics depicts something like being unemployed not as a societal failure, but as proof that an individual did something wrong. When in reality, unemployment is a natural outcome of a capitalist economic system. 
Even if everyone abides by and internalizes neoliberal values, even if everyone is hardworking, everyone is entrepreneurial, and everyone is self-reliant, unemployment will still exist because the state and private businesses have a mutual interest in keeping the cost of labor down, and very little incentive and means to create full employment. But back to neoliberal feminism. Neoliberal feminism takes all this language and political baggage and applies it to feminist themes. What comes out of it is this idea that if there is still inequality between men and women today, now that equal rights have broadly speaking been written into law, it's because women aren't working hard enough and aren't occupying enough leadership roles in government and business. And to understand how this neoliberal feminism works, a really good place to look is Sheryl Sandberg's book Lean In. For a little background, Sandberg used to be Facebook's COO, and in 2013 she released this book that almost immediately became a New York Times bestseller. At first glance, Lean In sort of looks like any typical self-development book, just one that happens to be marketed towards women. But it's much more than that. For the feminist scholar Catherine Rottenberg, Lean In is a great representation of what neoliberal feminism is, and because the book is so popular, it actually had a big part in defining this ideology. In Sandberg's own words, Lean In is, quote, sort of a feminist manifesto. And in it, Sandberg sketches out the main tenets of neoliberal feminism, its commitment to an individual approach to politics, its race blindness and class blindness, among others, and its specific definition of inequality as being a lack of representation. Very early in the book, Sandberg shares her intentions for writing it, saying, quote, more female leadership will lead to fairer treatment for all women. In the early chapters, gender inequality is consistently associated with a lack of female representation at the top, to the point where the two become synonymous. For Sandberg, capital E equality becomes defined as equal representation in leadership. And in practice, taken to its logical end, this vision of feminism leads to moments like this. Hillary Clinton calling the election of the Italian fascist Giorgia Maloney a step forward, because it's a case of a woman achieving a high status. To be clear, gender parity is a good thing. The problem with Sandberg's approach, however, is that it considers that gender parity in leadership is both the ultimate measure or goal of equality, the means by which it should be achieved, and that it can be considered in a vacuum. If you apply that to the Georgia Maloney example, despite leadership parity being achieved by promoting a patriarchal, conservative, racist discourse that ultimately hurts 99% of women, it is still considered a step forward by neoliberal feminists because leadership parity is the central focus of neoliberal feminism. Like trickle-down economics, then, Sandberg's political strategy for feminism prioritizes a few women achieving a high status on the assumption that this will automatically bring benefits to all the other women on the lower rungs of the hierarchy. This philosophy is justified on the basis that since sexism is a barrier to women achieving this status, which is true, that therefore getting to the top is earned. But that also implies that if you're not at the top, then your status, and whatever oppression you might still face, is deserved. If you're not at the top, it's because you didn't lean in hard enough, and you didn't work as much as you could. After all, if she could do it, so can you. It doesn't take much to see what this produces. It's a vision of feminism that still holds 99% of women back. Because even if all women were to apply Sandberg's advice to their own life, the benefits would still only apply to a handful of them. There are only so many spots at the top. And this is made particularly regressive given that Sandberg's explanation for what's missing for women to reach the top is self-assurance, and that economic and social pressures ultimately play a small role. The majority of Sandberg's book is dedicated to internalizing the revolution. For Sandberg, this turns out to mean that it's on women to look inward, and overcome their fears of being too outspoken or quote-unquote aggressive, and essentially conform to the norms of the market in order to close the leadership gap. Since Sandberg's book, and neoliberal feminism more generally, makes very little mention of how structuralized racism, classism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia might play a role in holding women back from this career trajectory, it ends up excusing the fact that it's mainly white, cishet, upper-class women who close the leadership gap in practice, often while benefiting from the labor of racialized, working-class, and migrant women who are hired at a lower rate to take on domestic work. Because this version of feminism measures equality by the ability of individuals to achieve success independently, other people become, in Rottenberg's words, mere means to that end. 
The result is particularly important when we focus on care work, or reproductive labor. Reproductive labor, broadly speaking, is work associated with raising children and the domestic labor that prepares humans for waged work. Since the transition from feudalism to capitalism, and the separation of productive labor from reproductive labor, the former creating profit and earning a wage, and the latter being mostly unpaid, reproductive labor has largely fallen on women's shoulders based on the myth that women are naturally more caring and therefore intrinsically better suited to this labor that, even when it is paid, should be paid very little. This has been around for a couple hundred years now, but where it once used to be a formal part of the capitalist economy, it's started to become a bit of a problem for its justification. There is a tension in neoliberalism. Because reproductive labor is absolutely necessary to the proper functioning of the economy, at the end of the day you need workers to work, and someone has to give birth to them and raise them. But there is no market mechanism for this labor to generate profit and earn those who perform it a wage. For an economic system that benefits from bringing as much as possible into market terms and market relations, this is a problem. How do you justify all this necessary labor going unpaid? Well, it turns out that neoliberal feminism resolves this tension, at least temporarily, and it does so by including reproductive labor into what it means to be a successful woman with the idea of balance. The economic distinction between labor that reproduces and labor that produces is foundational to gender depression under capitalism, and neoliberal feminism doesn't really challenge this idea. Instead, in Lean In, Sandberg extols the value of women who are committed to both their careers and their families. Quote, Women are surrounded by headlines and stories warning them that they cannot be committed to both their families and careers. They are told over and over again that they have to choose, because if they try to do too much, they'll be harried and unhappy. The good news is that not only can women have both families and careers, they can thrive while doing so. I hope you find whatever balance you seek with your eyes wide open, and I hope that you, yes you, have the ambition to lean into your career and run the world. In a neoliberal world where childcare is privatized and unaffordable, neoliberal feminism squares the circle on what to do with all the reproductive labor that still needs to be done. And it does so by relying on individual women finding balance. Instead of a social, collective approach with nationalized, universal childcare and mandated shorter workdays so that everyone can have time set aside to be used on reproductive labor, Neoliberal feminism places the burden of figuring all this out on individual women carving out their successful journey in a competitive environment. Neoliberal feminism maintains the discourse of care work being separate from productive work, maintains the idea that it must be an individual task, and then delegates to women the responsibility of figuring out how it must be conducted on the idea that achieving balance makes them more successful. It does not state that women must do this labor themselves and even encourages women to split this labor with men or hire someone else to do it. However, it still places on women the responsibility to figure out who will do this labor. Women are made to be entirely, personally responsible for the organization of economic and reproductive labor. Otherwise, they fail to embody the neoliberal feminist ideal of a successful woman who thrives at home and at work. But the clearest example of the limitations of individualistic, neoliberal feminism can probably be seen in how it approaches reproductive freedom. When it comes to reproductive freedom, neoliberal feminism is almost exclusively concerned with securing the right to abortion. In a post-Dobbs world where that right is no longer guaranteed, and even during the Roe era where it was constantly being undermined all across the country, this is obviously a central part of reproductive freedom. The right to safe and accessible abortion is obviously a massively important part of reproductive freedom, but it's pretty clearly not the whole story. Neoliberal feminism doesn't consider something like the fight for living wages to be a feminist issue. It believes that it's up to every woman to carve her own path in the workplace. However, if we take a more structural approach to feminism and reproductive freedom, it's obvious that full reproductive freedom includes the right to choose to have a child and that economic structures outside our individual control have a deep impact on that right. If someone can't afford to raise a kid, if they can't feed their kid, house their kid, have time to take care of them, then the freedom to have a child only extends to those who have the money to. Abortion rights cover the right to not have a child, but not the other side of reproductive freedom, which is the right to choose to have one as well. In other words, reproductive freedom is embedded in society-wide structures structures that ensure there's always some amount of poverty, 
And that means that even with the best self-discipline, someone will always be excluded from some freedoms until these society-wide structures are changed or abolished. There will always be someone too poor to have a child, someone without full reproductive freedoms, as long as capitalist structures go unchallenged and collective action isn't taken to elevate everyone's wages to a livable floor. In short, feminism can't meaningfully be considered in a vacuum. It can't be understood as a uniquely individual project, nor can it be seen as something wholly separate from societal structures of power. But this is what neoliberal feminism does. Neoliberal feminism takes the approach that feminism's goal is to subtract the discrimination of women from the equation, and that this will improve the lives of all women. But gender is too intimately related to, and mutually co-constituted by class, race, sexuality, and ability to ever be fully divorced from them. And so this kind of feminism ends up leaving 99% of women behind, and only making things better for a handful of senators and CEOs. It's not emancipation when a minority of people find a place in the racial, heteronormative, and patriarchal capitalism we live under. Emancipation can only happen when this system is dismantled and replaced with something better. Something that encourages genuine solidarity and equality. A proletarian feminism that encompasses more than just the individual. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that my channel is only possible thanks to my patrons on Patreon. As some of you may remember, I used to make general interest science videos. I didn't particularly enjoy it, but it was easy to get sponsors for that kind of content. When I made the switch to political content, something I actually do enjoy, most of my sponsors bailed. It's understandable, not many brands want to associate with anti-capitalist content, but that means I've had to rely more heavily on the generosity of viewers like you. If you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate your support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord. It's a great place to hang out. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to countless other channels to chat, learn, and explore your interests. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be part of it. So if you'd like to help keep this channel afloat and get some great perks while you're at it, consider becoming a patron by visiting patreon.com slash second thought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my other content by following the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.